thank you. We will give you praise and we'll give you honor for who you are and what you are to us and for the power that we have that enable us to give you glory in all of our ways. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain Hood. Now we will go on and uh, see if there are any announcements as recommended by our Vice President. Are there any announcements? I'll announce one. Uh, I wanted to talk with uh, our chair of our health committee first, but um, I'll go on and, and just let you know, uh, there, are, there is a seminar that I'm working to help plan with the NAACP and uh, I'd like for us to be involved too, but uh, there is a group from the Midwest, mid part, central part of the country, and we're planning a seminar on quashing COVID. And uh, I had shared that with CETA before about the uh, uh, services that are available over with Dr. Peoples and that uh, health facility near the stadium. Uh, but we're actually going to have a seminar. It's either gonna be the, November, the first weekend in November or the second weekend. We'll be bringing in a bunch of scholars and doctors who will be uh, just there to answer questions about COVID and to really have an interaction with people in terms of uh, the pros and cons of taking shots and not taking shots. So they'll be able to answer whatever questions they have and there'll be representatives from the clinic where you can go get, uh, if you do contract the virus, you can go there and uh, we'll have all that information for you and get the antibodies within 10 days that will minimize the effects of the COVID and what they're saying will certainly uh, keep you out of the hospital and, and possibly any demise from that uh, uh, illness. So it's going to be either the first weekend in November, which I think is like the, that would be the- November the 6th. The 6th or the 13th. Yes. We just wanted to have it before the CEDAR meeting. So it'll be in the, from 11 to 12, at least an hour. So if you can put it on your calendar for both of those days, I will share the final date at the board meeting in November. So you'll have that. We'll have it all worked out by then. But I think we want to get as many people with questions about it. Uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the Moderma and J&J &J boosters, as you may already know, are both uh, available now. So there was an announcement on that yesterday or the day before. So that's going to be available. So anyway, uh, I just encourage you to come in uh, because Prince George's County is going to partner with this group. If you have insurance, well, it's, your insurance will I'm, cover it. If you don't have insurance, your, the cost will be free for the antibodies. Caroline, is uh, the NAACP going to send out a flyer and have you uh, coordinated this with uh, Dr. Wilhelmina Taylor? I'm, I'm saying, well, I just mentioned that I hadn't gotten to Wilhelmina because the information hadn't even gotten to the NAACP executive meeting yet. That will be next week. Uh, and okay. uh, since we have our meeting here, I wanted to just put it out there because it's in the planning okay. stages. It's being sponsored by the health committee as well as the women's committee for the NAACP. So I'm in the All right, process thanks. of helping them set that up. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any other announcements? Uh, Tanya, you want to talk about the uh, summit? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, good morning to, can you hear me? I'm here. Good morning to everyone. And I apologize for turning my camera off. Um, but you don't need to see me. Y'all know me. Um, on Monday, <clears throat> I hosted a youth summit at the Glen Arden Community Center. And we actually had a very wonderful turnout of, of high school students in the county. Um, presenters included Mr. Earl Johnson from the University of Maryland's um, Academic uh, Achievement Programs, the Educational Outreach Office. He shared some very valuable information with our students regarding research involving higher education and um, the household incomes of our families within the county. He also expressed to our students that he offers services in his office for free to help them with applying for college, um, taking 
the SAT and ACT tests and applying for financial aid to finance their college education if they want to go to college. So if you're interested or if you know any student who needs assistance with that, please feel free to let me know um, and we can make sure they have Mr. Johnson's contact information. We also had a presenter, Ms. Mary Williams, the outreach director from the United Negro College Fund. And she shared with our students what the United Negro College Fund is doing these days. And I learned something new. They're not only um, providing scholarships to students who attend historically black colleges and universities, but the UNCF is now offering a certification program for students in various areas. So I was very excited to hear about the expansion and growth with the UNCF. We also had a speaker, Ms. Bridget Flaherty from the IEC Chesapeake Work Development and Apprenticeship Program to talk to our students who may not wanna to go to college about transitioning from high school to work and how they can do that through an apprenticeship program. The presentation from Monday, the morning session, is posted on both my YouTube page, Tanya Sweat PGC, and it's also on my Facebook page, Tanya Sweat PG. So students, parents, the community at large can see the entire presentation. It's about two hours, but all of the information is there because it's all valuable and needs to be shared throughout the county with our children so that they can plan for their futures and for hours. So Madam President, I thank you for allowing me to share that information. Um, one other uh, announcement I wanna make on behalf of our membership and hospitality committee. We need as many strong able bodies as we can get to serve in the South County Economic Development Association. If you have not renewed your membership in CETA, we invite you to do so today. If you're not a member, we invite you to join. CETA is a major stakeholder within Prince George's County, and we are making strides in Charles County as well. We advocate and educate for the, on any issue that has an economic impact on the quality of life within the Prince George's and Charles County communities. Those issues involve business development, retention and expansion, zoning, transportation, education, public safety, and legislation. Our objective is to promote economic empowerment for our citizens. So we invite you, we encourage you, we ask you to join us. There is much work to be done. We know the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So we are recruiting new laborers. If you are interested in joining CETA, please, please, please go to our website, CETA Inc dot org and take a look at our membership page. We have several different levels of membership, including individual, student, and business memberships. You can do an annual membership or a lifetime membership. It's up to you. But we invite you to check us out. Join us. CETA is on the move. We're doing great things. And we'd like to have you join our team. With that, I don't have any additional um, uh, name, President. name some of the vacancies that we have uh, right now. We're looking for certain people to fill our chairs as well as uh, yes. on, on the board. We do have uh, currently in CETA, we do have some vacancies we need to fill. Uh, we're looking for a corresponding secretary to help us with getting out our announcements, sending out our mailings. If you're interested, please reach out to our president, Ms. Jane Taylor Thomas, excuse me, or you can contact me and let us know if you're interested. And to sweeten the pot, because corresponding secretary sometimes is a little bit of work, we do reimburse the corresponding secretary for expenses and time involved with serving. We also are looking for a Trans transportation chair, community relations and outreach chair. Yes, ma'am. We need a person who's willing to work within the community and help us partner with other organizations on issues that cross several boundaries and several groups. So if you're interested in being community outreach and relations chair, please let us know. 
We also need an education chair, someone to help us monitor what's happening with both the uh, Prince George's County Public Schools and Charles County Public Schools so that we can address issues as necessary in education. We need a transportation chair. There's a lot going on with transportation within the county, within Charles County and within the region. So we're trying to monitor all the transportation projects that are ongoing at the moment. And we would like to have a chairperson of that committee to help assist us with that. Uh, I think those are the four major vacancies that we have. But if you're interested in serving in any capacity, we also have, um, just so you know, a business relations committee that is chaired by Ms. Sonia Williams. We have an international affairs committee chaired by Dr. Levi Zangai. We have our health actions committee chaired by Dr. Wilhelmina Taylor. We, our program committee is currently chaired by acting chair, Ms. Esther Williams, who's on the line with us today. And I'm sure she would welcome any additional assistance with planning programs and general meetings for CETA. And who am I missing? Um, we have our legislative um, and zoning chair, uh, Ms. Linda Thornton Thomas. And she's a very busy lady as well. Many of you know her as our uh, Prince George's County chapter NAACP president. So I know she would welcome assistance. We're taking a look at all the legislation that's happening within the county. We're currently doing redistrict, redistricting. We also have zoning ongoing within the county. So if you're interested in those subjects, please think about joining the legislation and zoning committee. Um, I think Is I hit close? everybody. If I missed you, blame my head, not my heart. <laughs> it's I don't uh, have close my to agenda in front of me. Uh, Tanya, it's close to 1030. Um, the young man from the uh, county, the, uh, mm, I'm sorry, the uh, attorney's office. The state's attorney's office, yes. The attorney's office is, uh, is the state's attorney nearby before I get started on our uh, welcome right. address? Um, she is nearby. It is going to be, I know it's 1026. I know it's going to be more like 1030. She's currently um, on a, another panel that's uh, addressing domestic violence. And I know that as soon as she's done with that, she will um, join this, this panel as well. Um, but, you know, we're not we don't wanna hold up your meeting. So if you want to get started, you know, uh, myself, um, Deputy State's Attorneys, uh, Perry Taylor and John Church are also on this call. Uh, mm -hmm. It's our Legislative Affairs Director. So we do have representatives from the office. Okay, so uh, we can uh, start and um, I guess the chair, uh, okay. Why don't I wait for about three more minutes and then I'll, oh. do you have That's anything fine. you would like to announce or any further announcements? If not, I'm gonna say good morning. Welcome to the South County Economic Development Association's Crime and Committee Program, Community Program. On behalf of the officers and members of the South County Economic Association, Development Association, known as CETA, we welcome our guest speakers, when they, our visitors, and other social media. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I am Jane Taylor Thomas, President and the CEO of CETA. CETA aims to provide community-based leadership and planning for economic growth and development in Prince George's and Charles counties, eventually Calvert County. I'm going to introduce our chairperson for the uh, Public Safety Committee, who is Terry Sweat. Mr. Sweat is a retiree from the United States Air Force, as well as Federal Civic Civil Service. Terry currently serves as a contractor with the Department of Homeland Security. While living in Florida, Mr. Sweat served as Deputy Sheriff in Okaloosa County for 12 years. Mr. Sweat, are you on? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, ma'am. 
you 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 may want to introduce uh state's attorney Bayboy. Uh, and she will be yes, on ma'am. shortly. Okay, you may want to do that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Madam President. Um, You're welcome. So, uh, introduction of guest speakers, we have two. Um, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Brave Boy and uh, the Chief of Police, uh, Malik Aziz. Um, so, to get started, um, with uh, the Honorable uh, Aisha uh, Brave Boy, State Attorney for Prince George's County as State Attorney. Uh, Ms. Brave Boy is the top law enforcement officer in the county. Her motto is, crime is personal, personal to the victim, personal to the community, personal to the state's attorney's office. Ms. Brave Boy gra graduated from the University of Maryland College Park with a Bachelor of Arts in Government and Politics. She received her Jewish doctorate from Howard University School of Law. Ms. Brave Boy is a member of the Sanctuary of, at Kingdom Square and Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority, Inc. <clears throat> Before becoming state's attorney, she, uh, she was a general counsel, uh, manager, and member of the House of Delegates. Um, and to introduce the chief, like I said, we're not sure if he's going to make it, um, but just did he send background. anyone from his office? I don't know. I did nobody popped up at it. I'm not for sure. Maybe there is. I don't know. <clears throat> okay. But just just a little brief synopsis on him. Uh, uh, he's a uh, he's the uh, chief police for Prince George's County Police Department. On January 6, 2021, Mr. Elise became the chief of police for the Prince George's County Police Department. He served 29 years at the, with the Dallas, Texas Police Department, where he rose through the ranks from patrol officer to, to deputy chief. He is a former executive director of the National Black Police Association and was a presenter to President's Obama, President Obama's task force on 21st century police. <clears throat> So with that, those are introductions. Um, like I said, not sure if Miss uh, Bray Boy is on yet, but if those that are there want to fill in, that's okay. Sure, most definitely. And thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jason Abbott. I'm the principal deputy to our state's attorney, Miss Aisha Brave Boy. Uh, Miss Brave Boy is on another call. She is going to join us. Um, as soon as she completes that panel, she'll be joining us. Um, but we did um, want to, you know, we welcome this opportunity to speak with you all. Uh, it is our, our pleasure. Um, we do love to meet with the different organizations, different groups, and members of our community. Um, our office is a very uh, community-facing office where we engage with the, the community and, you know, let them know, you know, what it is we're doing uh, with regards to public safety. Um, in the county. And Ms. Brave Boy has uh, prepared a PowerPoint presentation uh, for this meeting. Um, she has forwarded it to me and I would like to share it with you all. So give me one second and let me uh, attempt to share this presentation with you. Um, she's here. She's here? Yeah, she's here. Okay, well then. <laughs> Without further ado, then I will introduce uh, our state's attorney, Ms. Aisha Braveboy. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jason. And do you want to share? Do you want me to share the presentation? I think you know my technical background is probably better. okay. I, I think I think I will share. Thank you so much. First of all, thank you to um, South County Economic Development uh, Corporation. I know that. Uh, or association, excuse me. I know that uh, you all have been just a leading voice for businesses in the Southern part of our county for years. Um, very, very powerful uh, voice uh, for the entire community. And I wanna thank each and every one of you uh, for the work that you have done and will continue to do. And I really appreciate uh, being invited uh, to present to you this morning. So I'm gonna pull up um, a, uh, our presentation. 
Um, I'm going to attempt to do the slideshow. Uh, so, okay. So I'm assuming, Jason, did you introduce everyone who was here from our office? You're muted, Jason. I, you know what, as soon as I started speaking, I was like, I'm mute. Um, I did earlier, um, I let everybody know uh, that Jonathan Perry and Ed were here, but I didn't okay. give them more information. Oh, okay, okay, wonderful. Okay, well, uh, uh, Jason Abbott, who you just heard from, is my principal deputy. Um, Jonathan Church is one of my deputies. He's also chief of our homicide unit. Um, and Perry Paler is also a deputy and he is chief of our guns and drugs unit. And Ed Burroughs, who you all uh, know, because uh, he served our community for years, is now serving our office as our uh, team court coordinator, as well as our director of legislative affairs. So um, we all thank you uh, for allowing us to be with you today. Um, so I really want to talk a little bit uh, first about the impact of COVID-19 uh, on uh, our office and the criminal justice system. You know, the courts uh, really were impacted because the courthouse is probably the uh, public building that has the most traffic in and out every single day. Thousands of people enter and exit the courthouse. And so when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, uh, the courthouse uh, was, uh, you know, pretty closed for a period and didn't really start to reopen um, until I think late last year. Um, and so there were a number of operational issues that um, that caused. Uh, the biggest one on our office was uh, the lack of having a grand jury to indict cases. So we were unable to have our grand jury that was already impaneled come in uh, to hear cases so that they can be indicted. And so uh, for a period of time, we were unable to indict cases. The grand jury uh, resumed on March 16th in our office uh, resumed indicting cases, uh, including carjackings and other cases that were charged in 2020 and 2021. So we have been able now to get through the backlog of cases that would have been indicted much earlier had the jury, grand jury uh, been available. But again, uh, because of COVID, um, we also um, wanted to make sure and the court wanted to make sure that there was appropriate social distancing and other measures uh, that would protect um, everyone, including the members of our grand jury. So that's, that's um, happened. And in addition to that, um, the court was unable for a period of time to hold jury trials. So we have a huge backlog of cases um, uh, that did not get to uh, go to trial during that period because again, um, the courts were practicing safeguards uh, to protect um, staff and also the public and defendants and victims uh, from uh, the pandemic. So it has had a significant uh, impact and, and we didn't feel the impact just here in Prince George's County or in the state of Maryland. This is an the, the impacts have been felt around the country. And so the criminal justice system really uh, has, has really been impeded in so many ways by the pandemic. Um, so as a result, uh, cases that what would otherwise have been disposed of uh, are still like in our courthouse. So we have a backlog of about 1800 circuit court cases. And so those are our more serious uh, crimes, including homicide, major crimes, uh, a lot of our gun cases, some of our drug cases, um, our violent, um, our special victims cases, which include rapes, sexual assault, child abuse, and other uh, violent crimes of a special nature. Uh, all of those uh, cases have really been uh, backlogged in our system. And so we are working hard now, obviously, uh, as the courts have reopened a little bit to get some of those cases tried. Uh, most of the cases that are being tried are our homicide cases and our special victims cases. And we have done a really good job of, of obtaining justice in those cases. However, 
the number of cases and trials scheduled is still relatively uh, low. So every week there can only be, again, because of the pandemic, the court is only setting in three jury trial cases. So if you can imagine a backlog of over 1800 cases and only three uh, cases can have uh, jury trials per week, uh, we are still um, suffering in, in so many ways from the impacts of the pandemic. The court is in the process of attempting to find a way to uh, uh, increase the number of cases that are uh, that we are able to try. And so we look forward uh, to working with our uh, circuit court and also our district court on expanding uh, the number of cases that can be resolved. But we do have a significant backlog right now. Um, along with that backlog was the increase in overall crime. So there was between 2019 uh, 19 and 2020, um, a 25.7% uh, uh, increase in homicides, um, a 182% increase in carjackings, 60% increase in uh, burglaries, commercial burglaries, and a 36 uh, or really 37% increase in a DV assault cases. And so, in addition, again, to the backlog of cases, we are still adding new cases. Um, again, this issue is not unique, um, unfortunately, not unique to our county. This is what um, you know. jurisdictions, especially jurisdictions of our size, are dealing with all over the country. I talk to my colleagues often about it, and we try to trade you know, ideas on how to better address it. Uh, but we have just seen, as a result of the pandemic, we have just seen um, the number of violent crimes increase all over this country. And, and unfortunately, it's also impacting us here in Prince George's County. However, we are, uh, we are working uh, very diligently uh, on some targeted approaches to address it. And I will ask uh, Jason, my principal deputy, to uh, talk a little bit about some of the uh, work we're doing uh, around carjacking and gun violence. So um, Jason, I'll turn it back over to you. Sure, thank you very much, Madam State's Attorney. Um, yes, um, everyone, as, as the State's Attorney was saying, you know, we did have the, uh, the, the temporary halting of jury trials and being able to indict cases, but case crime was still increasing and it wasn't like we couldn't do anything about that. You know, so our attorneys were still um, reviewing cases, still trying to submit cases to be charged, trying to resolve cases. You know, the job of prosecution still, you know, is ongoing, um, whether the courts are closed or not. And one of the things that our office did to be proactive in dealing with these increases that we're seeing is um, create, we created a carjacking task force. Um, Deputy State's Attorney Taylor is the chairperson of that carjacking task force. And what we did is get our local state, um, you know, community members, elected officials, and members, uh, you know, different stakeholders, members of the business community, we brought them all together to um, assist with uh, reducing the number of carjackings and violent crimes that we are seeing within uh, our jurisdiction. And as the state's attorney said, that, you know, it's not unique to just Prince George's County, it is occurring throughout our regional. And so we're also members of the regional task force, carjacking task force, um, because a lot of these carjackings that we are seeing are occurring in our immediate surrounding jurisdictions like Montgomery County and especially the district. Um, so our regional um, carjacking task force is our partnership with members of our region, especially um, the district of the attorney general's office of the district of Columbia, um, where we are working together to coordinate, you know, identifying individuals who have been charged with these carjackings and exchanging information so that we can, you know, be, 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 prep, be better prepared in prosecuting these cases and identifying individuals who are problems and what we can do to, you know, address those people and get them either incarcerated or provide them with the services they need if they're juveniles so that we can reduce these car carjackings that are occurring in our county and throughout our region. Um, as the state's attorney said, we are experiencing a tremendous increase in carjackings 
you know, throughout from 2019 to 2020 and to 2021. In 2020, you know, at this time in 2020, we were at 139 carjacking incidents. I mean, year to date, this year in 2021, you see that that number is almost doubled that we're at 255 carjacking incidents. Um, so what that means is that does a tremendous, you know, effect on our office because we want to prosecute the individuals that are committing these violent acts. Um, in 2019, we had indicted, well, we had charged 47 uh, individuals for these carjacking incidents. 30 of them were adults, 17 were juveniles. In 2020, uh, 50 adults and eight juveniles. And as you can see in 2021, you know, we've indicted 70 and charged 26 juveniles. Now, with regards to the juveniles, you know, because that we know that they are, you know, we still give them treatment as juveniles. Some of them may get uh, prosecuted as adults, but we do have a juvenile team that works really uh, coordinates with the District of Columbia in prosecuting uh, the juvenile offenders. Um, so what we've seen in, in, in addition to the increase in carjackings is an increase in gun violence. And with that increase in gun violence um, and still being proactive, um, the carjacking task force and Deputy uh, Paler, who chairs that carjacking task force, incorporated gun violence as another um, issue that the carjacking task force is uh, taking into, is looking at and is developing strategies to reduce the gun violence. Um, but our, our gun cases, so the gun cases that we are prosecuting um, between January of 2020 and September 24th of 2021, there were 2,643 arrests involving a gun that resulted in uh, an individual being charged. Um, what we do with those incidents is we review those cases and we indict the ones to be tried in circuit court um, that we that meet our, our, our criteria for being indicted in circuit court. So, and as a result of those 2,643 2, arrests, 1,420 um, of those individuals were indicted. And our office is a large office and we have many different units within our office that prosecute gun related crimes. Our guns and drugs um, unit, which uh, Mr. Paler is also the chief of, has currently has 578 indicted cases. Um, and those are dealing with, you know, felons in possession of guns or individuals that are prohibited from uh, possessing guns. Um, 139 of those cases that we've indicted are in our homicide unit, which Deputy John Church, he's the chief of our homicide unit. Um, Prince George's County Police Department does, um, is one of the, the best at closing homicide cases. So, um, you know, unfortunately we do have, you know, a high homicide rate, but the police department is successful in making arrests for the individuals um, that are responsible for those cases. And our homicide unit, as Ms. Brayboy stated earlier, um, has been doing very well in prosecuting those cases. And we've received um, convictions in the cases that we've been trying, for those homicide cases that we've been trying. Our major crimes unit is our general felony unit, which um, gets a lot of these handgun related cases as well, the armed robberies, a lot of the carjackings, the armed carjackings, a lot of the shootings that occurred in the county um, are, are prosecuted in our major crimes unit and they have 510 cases. Our special victims unit um, prosecutes the felony domestic violence, the um, ch child sex assaults, uh, child abuse, um, felony sex assaults, and uh, some of these domestic violence assaults do are committed with a handgun and 57 of those cases are being prosecuted in our special victims and family violence unit. And then our strategic investigations unit uh, is our the unit that uh, prosecutes gang related felonies and violent repeat offenders and violent crime string. And a lot of those incidents do involve guns and they have um, 112 of the cases. So we do indict a lot of the handgun related cases and they're, you know, they're dispersed throughout our office in the various units that we have to deal with violent crime. Um, there's a growing concern over the 
uh, increase in ghost guns in the county. A ghost gun is a gun that is assembled really by a kit of materials that you could purchase over the internet. Um, and the problem with ghost guns is that they don't, they're not uh, manufactured through like a gun manufacturing company. They don't have the serial numbers associated with guns manufactured by a uh, by a gun manufacturing company. So these guns don't have the identification marks, um, which, you know, guns that are manufactured on the, the uh, commercial market would have. So these guns are really difficult for the police to trace um, and difficult for the police to identify. And it is a problem in the, in the state, really. And um, in 2020, you know, at this time last year, there were 107 of those ghost guns that were seized. In 2021, now already year to date, we're at 203 ghost guns being seized. So, um, you know, our 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 boss, uh, Ms. Brave Boy, you know, uh, with her legislative background and with Ed Burroughs, who is our legislative affairs director, we are very active in Annapolis um, in supporting legislation and, and even bringing legislation um, to the table. And so, we are supporting. Uh, legislation in that Annapolis to help get rid of ghost guns on our streets. The legislation will close the loophole for the manufacturing of ghost guns, and it's aimed at uh, making clear that ghost guns should be considered as firearms and for the purpose of a use of a firearm during the commission of a crime of violence. Um, the Prince George's County Police Department noted a steady increase in the prolif proliferation of ghost guns over the last two years. Um, the police recovered 166 ghost guns and made 163 um, arrests in connection to ghost guns in two, 2020. Uh, because the because these, as I was saying, because these ghost these uh, these guns don't have the serial numbers and don't have the uh, the identifications of a of a of a gun that's manufactured through a traditional gun manufacturing company, it does make it difficult. Um, to track them and difficult to solve the crimes that are involving uh, ghost guns. Passage of legislation would create a legal requirement that persons selling an, uh, a ghost gun um, in Maryland have the same serial numbers and identify, identifying nut, uh, marks that as if they were selling a traditionally manufactured gun. Um, and it creates a legal requirement that anyone buying a ghost gun must have a handgun qualifying license. Uh, the passage of this bill will greatly assist law enforcement in pre pre preventing prohibited persons from purchasing and possessing handguns. Uh, the state's attorney's office for Prince County strongly supports this critical piece of legislation and vigorously recommends its passage uh, into law because, you know, that's one of the things, you know, the, the possession of a ghost gun, you know, you are a person that's prohibited from uh, possessing a gun, you know, they can't go and buy a gun from a gun manufacturer. They wouldn't because they're prohibited from doing so. So we want to really reduce and eliminate, you know, those prohibited persons from being able to buy these type of uh, weapons. Um, the Our Streets, Our Future campaign. Uh, Madam State Attorney. So thank you very much. So uh, throughout the, uh, the summer, starting in uh, June, of uh, 2021, uh, we began an Our Streets, Our Future uh, campaign, which really coincided with Gun Violence Awareness Month. Uh, we recognize that we can't solve the problem of violence alone. Uh, uh, law enforcement, we can do our part, but we also uh, need to work with um, other elected leaders, but more importantly, community stakeholders, business stakeholders, and uh, nonprofits who can provide jobs, mentorships, and really, you know, uh, build a strong foundation for success for young people in our community so that they don't turn to gun violence. So we are recruiting mentors. Uh, we are also hosting events throughout the uh, county. And if Asita would like to host an event with us, we would really love to do that because the, the business community. I'm in the CETA meeting. Oh, sorry, I'll wait. Yvonne? Yvonne? I apologize, uh, Ms. Brayboy. I'm about to put that on mute. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, so... Um, 
So if CETA would like to uh, work with our office, we would love to because the business community, quite frankly, could do um, a really great job of, of, of working with us to really show what's possible. A lot of these young people we're finding have absolutely no hope. And so when they don't have hope and they don't have role models and they don't know what they can be, uh, what they see in front of them is what they end up doing. And so we really would love to work with you all uh, as we uh, expand our reach with Our Streets, Our Future. But we've had a number of great community engagements. We actually bring jobs, opportunities to communities, and that's critical through our labor partners, through uh, the Army, uh, through other uh, through, through Employee Prince George's. I mean, we really have um, been able to connect a number of people with job opportunities. So we would love to also do that um, in your area. This is Domestic Violence Awareness Month and um, we have uh, consistently, my office consistently put the spotlight on domestic violence, not just in October, but all year round. But th since this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, I just wanted to bring up some of the things that we are doing in hope again that we we can partner with you and work with you as we move forward. Uh, so we combat domestic violence on all fronts in the community, legislatively, and obviously our biggest job is in the courtroom. So what we saw, and, and, and uh, domestic violence protective orders actually are handled by the, uh, the, the district court. Um, so it's really a civil petition that the protective orders are civil petitions. Now, if there is a, if, if, if an individual violates that court order once it's in place, then um, we uh, do try those cases, but the protective orders themselves are civil in nature. Uh, but what we saw during the pandemic again was an increase in the number of uh, domestic violence protective orders uh, that were sought. So there was a 39% increase from uh, 2019 uh, to 2020, a 39% increase. Uh, so 14,885 protective orders were sought in 2020 as compared to only 10,000. 702 in 2019. In 2021, year to date, we have um, 11,165 uh, protective orders that were sought, which is about a 0.9% increase. So it's kind of flattened out in terms of the numbers uh, from 2020 to 2021, but a huge jump from um, the baseline if we use 2019 as a baseline year, a huge increase. So we know that there's a lot of violence going on in our homes and that is very concerning to us. Um, and so those cases that become uh, uh, criminal cases uh, for us, um, you know, we, we have been working really hard on a, a number of fronts. We have a high risk, high lethality protocol. We also have a strangulation protocol. Uh, we've been doing a lot more engagements with, uh, within our community. So we've actually seen um, a decrease in the number of overall um, district, uh, uh, district court uh, cases, which means that we believe some of our interventions have um, uh, been, been fruitful, uh, have yielded some success, but it's still far too many. So in 2019, we had uh, 2,249 uh, cases that were in district court, which are, is our misdemeanor uh, uh, court. Um, in 2020, we had 2,032. And in 2021, we had well, year to date. Now, with this unfortunately, this number will grow, uh, 1,323 cases. Uh, but again, um, you know, we even if we see some improvement, uh, we know that um, it's still far too many um, because that means that there are still other people out there suffering in silence as well. Um, but we do a lot in our community. Uh, we have a Not One campaign that I created uh, that really gives a voice to survivors. We have an event coming up on the 27th of October. So we will get that out to your uh, president so that she can share it. We actually have um, a great uh, screening of a, uh, of a documentary produced by a survivor, uh, along with a panel discussion involving survivors. So we hope that you all can come out to that. And that's on the, the 27th that will be at Prince George's Community, uh, Community College. 
Um, so I just mentioned that one on the 27th. We also have a victim services town hall, and that's for all victims, not just victims of domestic violence, but all victims uh, from 530 to 730 on the 21st, and that is virtual. So we will send you that flyer so you can share it. And if you know anyone who needs help, or would like to become a service provider because we, we appreciate expanding uh, our services that we can provide our victims, um, please let us know. But that's on October 21st. And um, just want to let you know, as we work really hard in Annapolis to strengthen laws, to give us tools uh, to combat all sorts of things, including domestic violence, we led the fight. And I'm so proud that my office led the fight to make strangulation a first degree felony. And this is the you know, this is very important because strangulation is the most lethal form of domestic violence. Uh, a strangulation victim is seven times more likely to end up a victim of homicide. And so we worked really hard on that. We also then developed an interagency strangulation protocol between our office, law enforcement, healthcare professionals, and several social services agencies. So if you are a victim of strangulation or if you know someone who is, we really ask Ask that they, you know, uh, you know, come forward. Um, there are ways that we can detect strangulation uh, that, that we couldn't detect it before. The Prince George's Hospital has a, um, uh, a forensic machine called the Cortex Flow that can take a forensic uh, picture, or sorry, that can conduct a forensic examination of the inside of a throat which can show evidence of strangulation, even if you can't see it with the naked eye. And that's really helpful as we prosecute these strangulation cases and seek tougher penalties for abusers. So the protocol really uh, goes into effect as soon as um, the, a 911 call is made, the dispatcher, if, if it is a DV call, should ask and does ask, have you been strangled or have you been choked? If the victim says yes, then that information is related to then the first responder. The first responder is, uh, you know, what will complete uh, a, a domestic violence supplemental and they will provide um, an opportunity for the victim to go to Capital Region Health or Prince George's Hospital, as some of us still affectionately call it, the Capital Region Health, uh, where they can get the forensic exam. And we really encourage our victims to do that uh, because not only does it help us in terms of a, a later prosecution, but it also helps them uh, because then they're able to get the appropriate treatment and care that they will need um, in order to uh, really recover from strangulation. Uh, because oftentimes strangulation victims are more likely to end up having strokes. Uh, you know, th they could have brain damage. They could have other uh, side effects that's not that are not just physical, uh, but psychological and emotional. And so it's so important that strangulation victims get the help that they need early. And so um, after uh, you know they they complete their 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 forensic examination and get that care, uh, we look at those cases for prosecution. We will subpoena the medical records so that we can have that information in order to to move forward with our prosecutions. And as of last year, again, we are able to now charge these cases as first degree felonies. And we are using uh, that tool in our prosecutions right now. So um, I won't go through the, the you know, all of the, the changes in the law, but just let, but just want to let you know that, uh, that because of the work that we have done, we can now seek up to 25 years for someone who is uh, an abuser and who has strangled someone as a result of um, domestic violence. We also last year, uh, and I want to thank uh, thank uh, you know Ed Burroughs, who really worked uh, very hard on uh, this legislation, as well as my Special Victims and Family Violence Unit, uh, we were able to get the continuing course of abuse against children uh, considered a first degree uh, felony as well. Um, believe it or not, there were children who were medically diagnosed as being tortured, who because um, each individual episode of abuse did not um, meet the threshold for, uh, for first degree child abuse, uh, which meant that there were life-threatening injuries or an impairment of an organ or loss of an organ because it didn't meet that narrow definition um, 
of the, the previous statute, uh, 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 prosecutors across the state could not charge first degree child abuse, even though a child had been subject to a, um, continuous abuse. And, they, and it would be considered second degree child abuse. So I'm not saying that, that they wouldn't be held accountable, but not for the more serious events. Now, uh, because of the work that we've done, um, anyone that commits three or more acts of child abuse may be charged with first degree child abuse. And so we are really excited that we were able to get uh, that bill passed. I will pass it back. Well, I'll just talk a little bit about the fact that when I was state's attorney, I pledged that, look, we all have to hold uh, everyone accountable to one set of laws. And so I created a um, public integrity unit uh, that not only deals with uh, police use of force cases, but also other um, public corruption cases. And we have not only indicted police officers, but we have also indicted uh, volunteer firefighters and other government officials who have um, misused uh, their offices to, for their own personal gain or have um, committed misconduct in office. So I'll turn it back over to Jason to talk a little bit more about what we've done there. Okay, yeah. Um, all right, thank you, Madam State Attorney. As, as the State Attorney was saying, our, our public integrity unit is, um, you know, it, it is, you know, tasked with holding public employees um, responsible or holding them accountable. And in that, you know, in that, that duty that they have, you know, we have indicted uh, 13 police officers from various agencies with charges ranging from second degree murder to assault, to theft, um, sexual assault, child abuse, attempted rape. Uh, we have two, we have won um, two trials uh, and convicted two police officers um, for these types of offenses. And then we, there are still uh, others that are pending uh, trials. Um, and continuing with, you know, the, the, what we've talked about in taking these, uh, taking these, these issues to Annapolis to effectuate change in the law, um, Anton's law, Anton's law went into effect um, of October of this year, October 1st, um, and it will declassify police administrative and criminal misconduct records from personnel records uh, to public records, allowing them to be inspected by civilians through the Maryland P Public Information Act. Anton's Law is named after a 19-year-old uh, Anton Black who died in police custody in 2018. Um, it puts uh, limits on when no-knock search warrants can be utilized by police agencies. It alters the standard requirements placed on general search warrants and requires law enforcement agencies to provide annual summarized data reports regarding their use of search warrants to the governor's office of youth uh, and victim services, uh, crime prevention and youth and victim services. Now, with regards to, you know, why this is so important is because, you know, we all want um, our prosecutions to be transparent. We all want, uh, our, you know, the community um, and when we're presenting cases, when we're prosecuting cases, we want, uh, everyone to know that these, 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 these prosecutions are based on witnesses that have integrity, that, these, that the police officers who are being called as witnesses are individuals that are credible and do have integrity and are doing their jobs properly. Um, so it is, you know, that access to those records, you know, is a big step in showing that. Um, and it helps us, you know, when we're making our case um, for the prosecuting those individuals um, who have witnesses that are new members of the police department. Um, major police reform, reform legislation. Uh, House Bill 670 uh, makes various changes generally to relate to law enforcement. Um, it repeals uh, LEOBR, which is the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights, establishes provisions that relate to a discipline process for police officers, alters requirements for the Maryland Police Training and Standards Commission, uh, regarding training of police certification, training and police certification establishes the Maryland use of force statute, establishes provisions regarding investigations of police shootings, and requires each law enforcement agency to require uh, 
by January 2025, the use of body worn cameras and alters provisions regarding no knock warrants. And with regards to um, you know these these uh, changes, you know it is still going back towards you know the transparency and allowing the community, the member, the residents of this state, to know that these prosecutions, these police investigations, are being done you know ethically and being done with integrity. Um, police training. Uh, our office has coordinated numerous uh, training programs to teach police officers what is permissible under the Constitution. Deputy uh, State's Attorney John, Jonathan Church has led the way in our office for providing these trainings. He's come up with various trainings and incorporated our office and the police departments within the county um, to work on these trainings, putting, you know, and participating in these trainings. Um, you know, these trainings in incorporate constitutional law, what is permissible under the constitution when it comes to search and seizure, use of force. Um, our goal is to be proactive and out, uh, proactive with police officers so that and we, most of them are serving the community and policing for the right reasons, but it's important that they hear all aspects of these issues and be clear on the stance of our office. And so, you know, we want to work with our police, our law enforcement partners, you know, we know that we need the training and we want to provide that training to them as well so that, you know, we work with them on these prosecutions and we want to make sure that we are on the same page and doing things the right way. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And just just to uh, at the end, I want to make sure that you all know, and actually, we're going to be launching a new website. So we'll send you our new website very shortly. But you can reach us on all forms of so social media at at PGSAO News. So I want to give a plug. My communications team always tells me to make sure you know, folks follow us. So if you'd like to know what we're doing, uh, please follow us, um, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So um, I'm going to stop sharing now. And um, I want to ask first um, uh, Deputy Church and Deputy Paler if I missed it, if we missed anything, or if there are things that you think we should bring up um, at this time. Um, yeah, I just, we just want everyone to, to understand that, um, you know, along with that 1800 case backlog, um, we, we have, a, you know, a short of, shortage of attorneys. So when you saw from my unit, Guns and Drugs, one of my units, there was 578 cases that spread amongst four attorneys. So when we, when I joined the unit and began to take charge of the unit in 2019, each attorney was handling 40 to 50 cases, which, you know, we thought that was a good number. Now they're each well, oh, and we had seven attorneys. Uh, and now we are down to four attorneys and with 578 cases. So they're all well over a hundred cases each. And, you know, we're just, you know, pressing the county and the state for any and all resources. Um, yeah, and, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, well, thank you, Gary. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, it's important to know that we we try to spread out our attorneys in the office. We have, uh, because we just have such a high volume of cases because of the backlog, we also um, have, uh, you know, we've been able to get a couple of grants. So we will be getting a couple of grant attorneys to help with our gun cases. So we're really excited about that. Uh, but again, we are like everyone else, it's a very competitive uh, labor market. <laughs> and so we try to make sure that we are able to incentivize our attorneys to stay and, um, you know, you know, they are, let me tell you, my team is very tremendous. Uh, we do a lot of great work. Uh, we are, you know, we get great success, uh, but it is a lot of work. And because of the backlog, it's just that the cases have piled up, but uh, we'll work through it. And uh, we know with the help, um, hopefully of our administration, as well as our uh, policing agencies that we work with, uh, we'll all get through it together. Uh, but this is a very trying time for everyone. And again, we appreciate uh, you all, uh, you know, giving us this opportunity to talk about uh, our office and where, uh, Jonathan, did you have anything uh, to mention before we uh, ask for questions? No, ma'am, I didn't. I think everybody covered everything. It's nice to meet you all. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, I think that ends our presentation. Oh, and um, Ed Burroughs, I know that you all know Ed Burroughs. He's a member of the school board. He represents you there, but he works really, really hard every single day in our office. And he does a wonderful job of working with our young people, um, giving those who deserve it second chances through our teen court program. So we're so proud of him. And uh, also he uh, leads the way and we are, we are probably the most successful state's attorney's office in Annapolis. And it's because I've got, you know, someone who's amazing uh, handling that work. So again, Ed, do you have anything else to chime in about before we ask for any, you know, before, you know, we turn the mic back over to uh, Sita? No, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, State's Attorney Brave Boy. And I'm just gonna tell everybody, no, this is not Terry. This is his other half, Tanya. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> like, wait a minute. Oh, That's God. not the voice that we heard. <laughs> no, Terry's uh, recovering from a minor, some minor dental surgery that he had. So he had to go take his pain meds. So I agreed to pinch hit for him on the questions. Um, and before we get started, also our program chair, Ms. Esther Williams, we're going to tag team this, but I always like to be in order and do things properly. And because I agreed to step in and help my husband out here, um, I'm going to be honest and forthright. Um, you all know that I am running for county executive, and I also have a couple cases pending in your office, Ms. Bray Boy, because I do represent clients in Prince George's County as an attorney. And so I'm gonna make it clear from the outset, I'm not asking about any of my cases, all the questions that have been provided. <laughs> We're not going there today. All the questions that we have, have been provided by either members of the community or members of CETA. And they are regarding general aspects of crime and the crime statistics within the county. Some of them are actually probably more appropriate for Chief Aziz, but because he got pulled away. Um, if you want to give input on those, or if you have a perspective from your office, we'd appreciate you sharing any information that you can with the community. Um, one of the first questions we received last week involves our returning citizens. And we are all grateful that um, we have a uh, culture in Prince George's County that will allow those who sometimes run afoul of our criminal justice system to be rehabilitated and return to the community. But we're noticing a lot of attention on returning citizens right now when there are also other areas in the county that need uh, the same level of attention. We're just curious, or some of our members are curious, why is it so important at this time as we're trying to recover from the pandemic that returning citizens seem to be getting so much media and attention instead of other areas? Well, I know that um, recently uh, the, the Bridge Center at Adams House held a um, re-entry uh, fair. And I know that the County Council has a um, re-entry advisory board through our normal course as a state's attorney's office, we have a number of motions that uh, often get considered post-conviction post um, motions that get, uh, you know, that get filed uh, asking for, you know, reduction, reductions in sentences and other considerations post-conviction. Post so there's a lot of um, opportunities, I guess, for individuals not only returning from you know, let's say state uh, state time, but also federal time uh, to come back into our communities. And what what we have found historically is that um, a lot of these individuals who, let's say, um, are in the system, uh, depending on how much time they spend in, uh, most of them are not spending more than about three to five years inside. Um, and so, when they come back out, uh, oftentimes they are not coming out with um, the skills um, and the really the ability to to live successfully, and so they um, they turn back to a life of crime, and so um, recidivism rates are relatively high, 
And so as a result, um, focusing on um, those who are reentering, I think is really a, a way of also um, assisting with reducing um, crime because we don't want them to commit further crimes after they come back into the community. Um, I think what we don't want, um, and I don't, and I'm not going to speak for obviously the county executive or the chief or or the council for that matter, but I think what um, what I don't think anyone wants is to uh, for for anyone to believe that there are not other priorities in the county, but I can tell you, and, and Ms. Sweat, I'm, I'm sure you know this, um, recidivism is a, is a problem. And if an individual is able to successfully reenter society, get a job, get skills, get counseling, housing opportunities, things like that, then they're more likely to be successful than when they're not. Um, but I, I do believe that the, that the county and certainly our office is focused on a number of priorities. That just happens to be one that I think has gotten a lot of attention uh, recently. Thank you for that. Board member um, Wills Anderson, I see you have your hand raised. Uh, I let think me you're just, still on move. There you go. Uh-huh, yeah, I take time to get it off. Uh, first of all, thank you, Tanya, Madam Pre uh, Vice President. Uh, welcome, uh, State's Attorney Brayboy. First of all, before I ask a question, I want to acknowledge you publicly because Attorney Brayboy in her professional uh, career, her uh, professional status, has been a friend of CETA for years. I've been around with CETA for a number of 20 years, so I've been there when she has helped this organization move and be able to do what we do. She got us office space. Uh, she was very close to, to the county exec at that time. And however she could support us as a friend in the county, she did that. So on behalf of CETA, as a board member of CETA, Aisha, I just want to thank you because <laughs> I have I have witnessed her career coming all the way up, and uh, she is certainly a pillar of our community and a truly a contribution. So thank you. Thank you. So just listening to some of the things that you said, in terms of, uh, and I won't take a lot of time for other questions. And if there's if they can come back to me, or otherwise I'll get them to put them in writing. But I had some of a uh, as you were talking, and I really appreciate that report. And I see what you're, I'm, I'm, I can just acknowledge you and your staff and your office for what you all are doing, doing the crisis that we have. I mean, you're doing an extraordinary job, even though the, the numbers still say that there's a lot more to be done. But considering what we're working with, you are really truly out there on the court swinging on behalf of the citizens. So I, I want to commend you for that and your staff. Uh, one of the things you, you spoke about was the uh, to see the crime that, and what I was looking at was that crime, we have numbers going up while we also have less staff to even work with. So you're working with a two-edged sword in terms of trying to get on top of the level of the problem. So I would just say to you, I'm not asking you to, to really go into it. We can see this, but I would say, you know, I would say perhaps what uh, CETA would be interested in seeing how it is that we can support you. If you can come up with ways in which we as a community can help galvanize community organizations with CETA economic development crosses all spectrums. If we can support you in different ways to help get those numbers down in terms of brainstorming or having a, a community, maybe some type of a large event where we do a brainstorming session coming not only from you, but for the community. You also mentioned the children, working with them in terms of crime. And I see a lot of that crime is with juveniles or the, the uh, carjacking may in fact, the number of those may be dealing with youth. And of course the circumstances in terms of jobs and whatever. CETA has worked with the youth and employment before. We were the agency that was that spearheaded getting the county exec at that time to raise the numbers on the summer youth program. They were, they were employing about 500 kids a year. We got those numbers 
spiked up into the thousands. And now I'm not sure where they are, but there's an entire program for summer youth program for in-school and, and summer employment that CETA actually helped galvanize a, a, a meeting for and the county exec Becker got behind it. So we've never really gotten a banner for that, but we are a commitment to the youth in this county. And then in other ways that I see that, you know, uh, even in terms of ex-offenders, I understand that because if we don't take care, particularly the gentlemen that have been put away for all kinds of, of uh, egregious problems, if we don't take care of the family, you know, we're still gonna have a problem. So I wanna mention that there is a doctor, his name is Dr. Uh, Watkins, uh, that has a book out on black health matters. It's piggybacking off of the George Floyd issue. Just came out about uh, maybe a month ago. And he, it's separated by all the, the uh, main illnesses in the African-American community, which are contributing to so much. But, and the next book he's got on the drawing board is for children. But I share this with you to say that he is somebody, he has gone into the prisons and worked with the prisoners. This was something he just felt compelled to do within his inner self. And when he finally did, he went in and because of his specialty, he's a medical doctor, but he has a, a list of specialties in a lot of areas that deal with, with, deal with gut versus uh, digestive systems and so forth and the brain. But he's been able to go in and work with the prisoners such that the recidivism rate has shifted because he's able to work with them on ways in which their brain is functioning and what it takes to move that energy in ways that they are uplifted and inspired to be better citizens of society when they re-enter. So I would be more than happy. He is a friend of my godmother, in fact. He is her son. And I'd like very much because he's looking to work with the African-American community to quite a twelve twelve some of these diseases that are not germane to our community. The only thing germane to African-Americans when they entered this country is sickle cell anemia. Everything else we've contracted since we got here. And we seem to be a community that has exploded in terms of cancer, diabetes, you name it. So I would very much like to introduce him to you personally. I will have him on the phone because he's putting together a whole program that's going to support health like we had in former days, sending doctors into the elderly population home so they don't have to get out and working with young people. His book is coming out on that soon. So I will get Caroline. another, excuse me, Jay, okay. a number of other things. I won't take any more time. That, and I apologize. That'd be great, Miss Caroline. We're running out of time. I have oh, no, another you meeting. Have, you have one okay. question though that I, I think was a, And I think Hello? you had a very good question that I did want to give the state's attorney the opportunity to, um, to answer. Well, I heard uh, a You asked oh. what was, but there's something CETA could do to help your office. If you could touch on that one for us, that'd be great. Yeah, that was a good one. Absolutely. I, so, so one of the things, and, and, and um, a lot of people don't know this outside of maybe elected elected officials, but for years, historically, Prince George's County State's Attorney's Office was the only office in the state that had to go to the legislature to get the number of assistant state's attorneys in the office increased. So there was a cap on the number of assistant state's attorneys that could be hired. That cap was lifted around uh, the time that um, uh, Glenn Ivey became state's, uh, state's attorney. Um, he worked really hard in Annapolis to remove that limitation. So if you can imagine the state's attorneys historically having to go to fight to get additional state's attorneys in a county that has consistently been growing, right? So you, you grow, unfortunately, there's more crime and you have to fight every year to try to get more staff. So historically, Prince George's County's state's attorney's office has been understaffed. 
she's been understaffed. There's no other way around it. And while there, the cap is no longer there, um, because of the way that the county budget process works, they typically ask agencies to stay within a certain amount if, you know, to, you know, every year, okay, we have this much budget, every, it, every agency can ask for an increase of up to, let's say, 6% or 10% potentially. In some years, if the budget is not um, at a level where, you know, the revenues are not at the level that was anticipated, then they ask us to cut our budget a certain amount. Because the state's attorney's office is still in that formula, it, it, our office has never really been able to go there grow excuse me there has to be a really a radical change in the thinking of how to staff and fund the state's attorney's office because the demands on a production of evidence has grown tremendously because of body worn cameras because of other surveillance footage that we are not only required to obtain but to review redact and turn over for discovery, the demands on an uh, attorney's time is not what it used to be. It's a huge, huge drain on our, uh, uh, on, our on the, the, the work that we do. And there's not an equal acknowledgement of that when it comes to how uh, our offices are staffed. So we have proposed a number of uh, changes and increases in terms of staffing for our office uh, to really be able to effectively uh, administer um, the justice system because that is our responsibility. So as we go into the next budget year, as we uh, propose a budget for our office, uh, what we would uh, ask is that you support us and we certainly will reach out to you and let you know uh, what uh, increases we are asking for and why, um, because the majority of our budget is salary. So it's not a lot of fluff. <laughs> it's really all about protecting and serving the people of the county. We have a very unique charge. We have to do our jobs within certain statutory time frames. We have to protect the constitutional rights of our defendants. We have to ensure that our victims have our rights are protected as well. And of course, that our community is safe. So we are not like a traditional county agency, but we are funded and thought of as a traditional county agency, regardless of any new responsibilities or requirements on our office. So there has to be a real radical overhaul in the thinking of funding our, our office. I can tell you that Baltimore City has double the number of attorneys that we have, but they don't have double the crime. But it is because historically, uh, Baltimore City has not had the same limitations that Prince George's County has had. And I'm not liking it, and I'm using the term vestige only because I'm just saying that, that, that the way that our, our office is treated really is a vestige of the past. It's, it's how historically Prince George's County State's Attorney's Office was treated uh, basically very politically in Annapolis by those who wanted to control the office. And now that the office has more self-control, it, it's, it's great. But in terms of our funding, our funding and staffing has not really kept pace with what every other state's attorney's office in the state of Maryland, um, where they are in terms of their staffing, staffing based on their level of crime. So our caseloads are much higher than anyone else. Um, and we uh, really need your help and your support in assisting us with getting um, really an overhaul in, 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 our, in how our, our uh, agency is, is uh, funded. So that's something that, that is a priority for us that we are uh, working on um, developing now. And when we uh, complete that, we're happy to share uh, some of the, 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 the changes that we are going to be recommending uh, with you. And we hope that we can get your support. Well, we, um, every year we do a somewhat of a legislative kind of review and look at possible statutes and laws that we need to recommend or even amendments. So this is one that I will definitely refer to our legislation and zoning chair and ask her to look into, because that is something that CETA, I'm, I'm pretty certain 
can support and is willing to support because we need a strong state's attorney's office in order to make sure our criminal justice system works properly. And, and who is your, who's your chair? I was going to say, who's your chair so um, we can <laughs> reach out? Yes, I'm, I'm sure you already know, probably already know her. Ms. Linda Thornton Thomas is our legislation and zoning chair. Yes. <laughs> It's, it's funny how we overlap in the community in a number of ways. Um, speaking of the, the system as a whole, how are things with your office and the Prince George's County Police Department? Um, we have ongoing reform in the county. And at one point there was much ado about a Brady's list that seems to exist. Are there any improvements or strides being made with bridging the gap there? Well, we don't look at it as a gap. I mean, we have always had the responsibility of ensuring that a fair administration of justice. And part of that is, you know, really at the point that the, unfortunately the justice system starts for a lot of people, which is at the point of arrest. And so ensuring that officers are treating people uh, fairly, uh, that there's constitutional policing going on in our county is our duty and responsibility. And I believe that the department equally uh, shares in that goal that their officers behave in, in a manner that, that's professional. And so where um, officers fall short, and sometimes they do, and, and it's not a lot of officers, but where the, when they fall short, you know, we have a responsibility. We must do our job. We must hold everyone accountable. And I believe that the department understands that. Uh, we have had a number of trainings, and I know that I think Jonathan is still with us. Uh, we train with them all the time, um, not just Prince George's County Police, but remember we have 26 municipalities. Uh, we have um, a number of other policing agencies, including Park Police, Metro Police. Uh, we have Campus Police. We have a lot of policing agencies operating in Prince George's County and every single one of them you know, uh, we we serve in a, in a way because we prosecute cases that they bring to us, and uh, we want the case to be about the case and not the officer. That is our goal to ensure that the case is about the underlying crime that is alleged to have been committed, and not about the officer who is bringing forward uh, the case. And so, I think we can all agree that that would makes for a stronger. Uh, prosecution and it makes uh, makes for a more just and fair uh, system of justice and I think that's what we all agree on um, and so uh, so the Brady list or Brady list or Brady information that we provide to defense counsel is nothing new um, the information as you know Miss Sweat we have to um, disclose information mm -hmm. that, um, that that tends to go to the credibility of a witness and um, could shine like more favorably to a client of yours, right? So, you know, you understand that that is our duty and responsibility. So, <laughs> right. so we've always had a, a list or we always have made disclosures, let's say. So when they say the Brady list, I think that's what, that's actually not the right term. I think we have developed um, a, what's called a do not call list. And these are officers um, that the state's attorney's office has determined uh, cannot and will not uh, be sponsored by the state. Um, and that's important because when we put on a witness, that means we stand behind that witness. That, that, that means that that witness uh, is, is someone who we are asking uh, the public uh, to, to believe in, that they are representing essentially the people and, and the prosecution of a case. And so we have to, again, ensure that uh, we have people who have integrity, who don't have racial bias, or who are not racist. Uh, we have to ensure that, you know, you all are well represented, and that is what I'm committed to doing. And so, um, so anyway, that, that's what that's about. The police department is well aware of it. We've had numerous conversations, and I think we all are in agreement uh, that uh, we have to um, ensure that every officer acts in a professional way and where they fall short. And especially if where they are falling short is creating a huge problem for prosecutions and the safety of our public, that it is the duty of our office uh, to ensure that those individuals are not placed in a position where they can impact uh, residents in our county. And that's my commitment. 
And, and I'll say, um, you're absolutely right. I'm well aware of the disclosure requirements, having been a prosecutor and a defense attorney. And nobody likes to try a case because a defense attorney says your witness was bad, especially when your witness is in uniform. So I can certainly appreciate the, the position it puts you in to have to do that. And I honestly will say as your colleague, we appreciate in, your in the community, your honesty about what's going on and your willingness to work on making improvements so that we know prosecutions, one are good prosecutions and two, to make sure you're holding our officers accountable to do right as they protect and serve within our community. Thank you. I have one last question and then I want to, I have to check with our program chair to make sure we don't miss anything, but a hot button item that we hear about a lot in CETA is traffic and traffic enforcement. And I will tell you as much as we appreciate the speed cameras, we hate the speed cameras. <laughs> Is there any plan or discussion um, within the county to do something about traffic enforcement? Is there a way we can partner with the Maryland State Police or the local sheriff's office to do traffic enforcement? What's going on there? So I can tell you that Jonathan Church, um, this is a little outside of our area of expertise, but Jonathan Church is actually a former uh, police officer uh, and he and he turned uh, into a prosecutor, and he's been doing a great job ever since. So, Jonathan, do you have any thoughts on that? On um, traffic enforcement that may not be as onerous, um, because I know that you know sometimes those speed cameras. Well, they, they you know they charge you a whole lot of money. If you, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I. I, I don't, is the question how they can ramp up more traffic enforcement or how they can do traffic enforcement differently? Differently, because it, it seems like the the, uh, the the speed cameras is, it, I mean, in some jurisdictions, they call it a cash cow. I'm not saying that's what they're saying, but sometimes sure. that, that becomes an, an issue itself, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I suppose, and I can't speak for the police department. I, I think Chief Basinich uh, could probably say more, but I suppose that, the, uh, the use of the traffic cams, the speed cams and so on is supplementing probably a, probably their traffic enforcement division. And they're probably placing these devices in areas where they get the most citizen complaints about speed and so on. So I can, I can see why they would do that. Whether there's a plan to change that or not, I, I'm not aware of it. Um, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. If you can put a machine out to deal with citizens complaints in a particular area where speed may have had an impact statistically on accidents, possibly injury accidents, um, that they would do that and it frees up their traffic safety enforcement division to, to address other issues as well. So, but I, I'm not aware of any change, but I certainly can understand why they would implement those types of resources. And having paid several hundred dollars to the, uh, to the fund as well, I can tell you, I don't like them either, but. I think somehow they're a necessary evil. <laughs> you say so well, look, I'll say this. As a resident of South County <laughs> who has to drive on Indian Head Highway day in and day out, we affectionately call that the Highway of Death. <laughs> Fortunately, this year, I don't think we've had any pedestrians be killed out there, but the, the rate of speed is still tremendously too high. And those who drive that road regularly know where the cameras are. So what happens? They slow down to 55. As soon as they pass that camera, they go back to 70 or 80. So I, under, I understand being in the legal field that the cameras are supposed to help. I, I'll be honest with you. I really don't think they're working other than to raise additional revenue for somebody. And oh, by the way, $40 isn't a lot of revenue to raise because I don't know many people who wouldn't mind paying $40 and not incurring the additional points, the court costs, and the higher insurance to drive 70, 80 miles per hour in a 55 mile per hour zone. I mean, it, it is what it is. So I will tell you that is one of those issues in the Southern part of the county that is still a hot topic for a lot of people. Cameras are not doing the job, and many of us would welcome the sight of more police cars 
and the writing of tickets. I know um, a lot of jurisdictions want to get away from having the police write those tickets because of what's been happening with the allegations of police brutality and insensitivity and the like, but we think it would help <laughs> if we had more officers on our highways to slow us down and make our roads a little safer. So that's just something to think about if you have any input in well, that area. Well, what I can tell you is that, you know, while that is not an area that we have jurisdiction over, uh, what I can tell you is that we are happy uh, to connect you uh, with Maryland State Police, because I know that they police, um, you know, part of that roadway, I think part of it's county, part of it's, I think they have some type of MOU down there, um, but we are happy to um, connect uh, you with um, um, our, any of our contacts at Maryland State Police, we can send that through Mr. Burroughs. Um, and um, I think it would make sense to maybe have a meeting with them, um, your council person, um, and maybe someone from Prince George's County Police and to try to figure out what, um, what, what a better uh, enforcement um, a strategy uh, for that part of the county, because we, we recognize that you have to live there, right? So it's one thing, um, I guess, when you stand back and say, okay, this is what we need. It's another thing when you are basically the end user and you're driving and using uh, those roadways and how the practical effect of, you know, even maybe good intentions. So I think maybe having a meeting with those who are responsible um, could be helpful. In addition to that, the Department of Transportation so maybe having a larger meeting specifically about that issue would be helpful. And we're happy to help facilitate um, getting those players to the table. So just let us know what you need us to do. Absolutely. And I assure you, our members would appreciate that. Madam Program Chair, did we have any other questions that I might have overlooked or missed? Um, I do have uh, two that came in and um, just one from me. Um, first, I wanted to thank uh, Ms. Brave Boy for, um, for being here today. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of yours. Um, secondly, um, in your office, who would be the person to contact for um, two of your programs? So um, I know my church does, um, and you probably know uh, Pastor Battle. Um, yes from Zion, he has a re-entry program um, for our men and women who are coming back into the community um, and wanted to know who you would contact um, about that. And also there's a young man that I know who's starting a, a program in Prince George's County and wants to get involved with um, helping out the youth. Um, creating jobs for our youth for summer and um, training. So is there someone that um, we can contact in regards of both of those uh, type of programs? Yeah, I would say my chief of staff and I'm gonna put her um, email address in the chat. Okay. Um, yep. And then you can also um, contact Mr. Burroughs as well. So I think, you know, just um, uh, if you email both of them, I'll put his email address in the chat as well, unless he can put it in the chat because I'm not exactly sure if I'm spelling his last name right. <laughs> <laughs> and are you in a position to put your, your, your email address in the chat? Okay, I think I, I think I see his name up there, so I think I'm gonna spell it right. <laughs> I know he was handling another issue for me, so. Um, yes, I am. Oh, oh, okay. Can you? I, just, I, was, I, I, I was trying to put in the chat, but my phone was on mute, so I had to like leave the chat to come say yes. Oh no, I no, could. no, no! Don't worry. Did I? Did I put? It, um, I put E P Burroughs B U R R O U G H S at C O dot P G dot M D dot U S. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. perfect. I got it right. <laughs> so yeah, if you can send an email to both both of those addresses, then we'll get back to you. Thank you. Um, the next question is from um, Ms. Peterson, um, the dear state's attorney, Bray Boy. Um, good to know what surrounding communities are working uh, 
working with and elimination of our county. Oh, limitations. Limitations, yeah. I'm sorry, of our county. Um, thank you to for your team. Thank you. Um, and the other statement that I had, so um, Ms. Caroline wanted you to know that the um, James Bordley um, and Ms. Caroline Wills um, Esquire, are, the members of CETA are also legislative commute in the, uh, for the committee, and they're looking forward to working with you um, in your office on behalf of CETA and support um, to increase funds for the office of the attorney general's um, office um, concerning any of your needs community. Oh, and the state's, state's attorney's office, community. but we'll, yeah. we'll take it. We'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, no, no, no worry. No, no worries. And I know that Mr. Burroughs, uh, because he handles our legislative work, I know he will be in touch uh, with um, Mr. Bordley and also um, Ms. Thornton Thomas. So thank you. Okay. Um, and yes, as we said earlier, she, she had a previous engagement, so she's not here today. Um, does anybody else have any questions? And if so, can we um, please keep them brief as our time is winding down? And I know um, Ms. Brave Boy does have another meeting after this. So if we could keep them short, if anyone else has any questions, two minutes as possible, please. Anybody else? I'm opening up the Zoom for questioning. Yes, this is Ms. Williams. Can you hear me? I'm on the phone. Uh, yes, Dad. Good morning, Mr. Williams. I have a question on policemen shooting to wound rather than shooting to kill. You, got, you never hear of a of a shot being fired by an officer where the victim was wounded is always killed. Is there any consideration right, on policemen shooting to wound rather than shooting to kill? I understand the situation that a policeman is caught into, but if you look at the training of federal officers and FBI agents, they have pictures popping up where the officer either fire his gun or don't fire his gun or shoot in a different direction. That's been my concern. So I can tell you, and again, I'll um, you know certainly ask any of my deputies to chime in. I, I can tell you that in uh, Prince George's County, um, as most police uh, agencies have, they have what's called general orders. And in that, those general orders, um, there is a use of force continuum which is the force that is allowable or permissible to be used based on um, either the resistance or the threat level um, that they uh, that they are perceiving and it has to be a, it has to be based on um, an objectively reasonable standard that's the standard and um, uh, the, that the Supreme Court has set up set forth in Graham versus Connor when it comes to police use of force. So there's a use of force continuum that starts from, uh, at the level of just mere presence and it, it, you know, it, and it escalates to you know, a verbal command. Uh, there could, um, if, if the threat is, is larger, if there's a resistance, they can use other tactics and like uh, um, uh, to, to, to ensure that the, that the individual is, if they're being arrested, um, that they can get them under arrest. So they use certain pain tactics in order to do that. And, and the type of, of force that can be used is um, it relates to the type of threat that is presented. And so lethal force is permissible if there is a threat um, of, uh, you know, serious physical injury or um, a potential, you know, life threat, life, you know, like where, 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 where an officer perceives that his life is in, his or her life is in danger or someone else's. And so the, the way that the officers are trained, and I, I'll again turn it over to Jonathan, who was a police officer, is um, my understanding they're, they're, the way that they are trained is to stop um, that threat. And so how they stop the threat and what 
uh, weapons they use um, because uh, they have other what's called less lethal force that they can use like um, like the stun guns, like um, beanbag, um, bean bags and other what's considered quote unquote less lethal force. Um, and, but I think all of it is based on the situation. So it's all situational uh, based on, again, the threat and the environment. So um, Jonathan, can you talk about this issue of can there be some other way of, you know, handling a situation where it could call for the use of deadly force but so, which means that you can pull out your weapon, but um, in terms of how you're stopping that threat, you know, instead of like shooting center mass, which is I think what typically happens that there's something else that, that the officer can do. So can you talk about how you all are, well, you were, <laughs> uh, that, that training and the thought that ha has gone, gone into that? Sure, uh, you know, so, I in, and obviously, I'm speaking from experience 15 years ago, and I did spend 20 years as a police officer. Uh, I mean, the first thing I will tell you is the idea of shooting at a part of a body that would only wound versus incapacitate is usually ruled out immediately because you never know who's behind that person or somewhere else and where that will go. Otherwise, and so you're, 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 uh, the risk of harming somebody else is great. Officers are terrified of hurting somebody else uh, that is not involved in the area. And that's one thing that has increased when you try to shoot at smaller areas or whatever. Um, it, and I will say this, I mean, my experience as an officer, and I'd say the majority of officers, nobody wants to wake up one day and get involved in a shooting. That's not what they're looking to do. And so what has happened, and Ms. Braveboy did a good job of laying it out, is there are, we're providing, and departments are providing officers with different resources and opportunities or devices or whatever you want to call them that are le not lethal, that will increase their ability to control the situation without going to the lethal part. And tasers, obviously, are one of those things that was implemented within the past 15 years or so, I believe. Um, as a way of dealing with scenarios without them becoming lethal. So it, and officers are trained in, in one, uh, dealing with and assessing a situation. Um, even citizens, I believe, have gone through these shoot, don't shoot scenarios where they're also given the option or opportunity to, to be placed in a scenario and see what they would do. So uh, the, the training keeps going on, and I know there's a national trend toward figuring out ways, uh, other less lethal ways to deal with situations that become volatile. So they're constantly evolving and training and learning. I, I'm unaware, honestly, of the, I think you mentioned that the FBI and, and uh, the feds are doing something different. I'm not aware of anything different that the feds have done. I, I am unaware of any police department going shoot to wound because of the reasons I just kind of gave you, not to mention the fact that I think as Ms. Braveboy said, if you've come to the point of using deadly force, that the goal is usually to stop the threat. Now, multiple shots may not be necessary and sometimes that becomes an issue, but the end goal Check at least- the training. Be... Check the Pardon? training that- federal officers get at, at Quantico. At if you're unaware of the training that federal officers get. My uh, question. I'm, I'm aware. My but I, yes, sir. I'm aware of the training. And I, I believe the police departments are as well. And I guess all I can say, because we can't speak for the police departments, is they are making efforts to, uh, to improve. I think that probably would be a more appropriate question for Chief Aziz. But um, I, from what I see, they're making efforts to improve. Esther? And, Esther? And, yes, ma'am, I am here. And I'm I, sorry. I, um, I, I apologize, and, and uh, I, I, please forgive me, and I, I don't mean to interrupt. I have to be on another Zoom at 12, and but my staff can be here for a couple more questions, so I do apologize that I personally have to leave, um, but I thank you all so very much and look forward to partnering with you 
Um, we can do any events that you would like to do. We, again, we have our, our Streets, Our Future initiative. We go around to different communities. We do bring job resources, counseling, and other things. So if there's anything that you all think you want to do with us or if anything that we can support you all in, like um, assisting with getting uh, some of the resources to, to talk about the traffic issues uh, on Indian Head Highway, please let me know. Um, we are here to be a resource. We don't control everything, but we can facilitate and we're happy to do that. And I thank you so much again for inviting me and look forward to another invitation in the future. Uh, this is Jane Thomas and uh, I wanna thank you very much for attending our meeting and bringing your staff and we look forward to working with you as well. Thank you, thank you all. You're welcome. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure um, meeting all of you. Likewise. Madam President, the floor is yours yes. for closing announcements and adjournment. We already have announcements uh, at the beginning. We also have our next general meeting will be Saturday, November the 20th, 2021. The theme is how to be thankful despite the ongoing pandemic. And uh, we didn't have a chance to introduce any of the board members, so um, uh, there were some who introduced themselves. But uh, I want to thank those who attended the meeting as well. So it's 12 o'clock. I have to be at on a genealogy conference, so I'm going to sign off, and I want to thank everybody for attending. Hello? Thank you, Ms. Jane. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Jane. You're welcome. You can continue if you want. I just have to get on a uh, conference. Uh, yep. So I want to thank everybody um, as the chair of um, the general meeting. Um, thank you for your attendance. Thank everyone for all of their questions. Um, thank the board members who are in attendance today. And I think that is it. I do too have somewhere to go. I've got to go to a football game. My son is playing football. Um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. And again, thank you so much. Um, Tanya, is there anything else you would like to say? Did Tanya leave me? Uh, she's probably going to say root for the Colonias, Robert <laughs> Morris football team. <laughs> well, everyone have a good rest of your afternoon um and you have a good sunday enjoy your weekend and um we look forward to having you in uh cedar's uh, general meetings again or our uh monthly meetings which are the uh first of uh first monday in every month again thank you so much and everyone have a great great weekend Bye. Bye, bye. We thank Mr. Abbott for just being here also. And oh, thank you. All. Yes, okay. Thank you. It was, it was okay. my pleasure. Thank yeah, you very we look much. Look forward to working with you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Take care. All righty. Bye bye. Bye. Stop. Yes.